Chapter Two of Aunt Jane's Nieces in the Red Cross by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Two: The Arrival of the Girl. A sweet-faced girl, very attractive but with a sad and anxious expression, descended from the Pullman and brightened as she found her friend standing with outstretched arms to greet her. Oh, Maud! cried patsy usurping the first hug how glad i am to see you again beth looked in maud stanton's face and forbore to speak as she embraced her friend then jones shook both hands of the new arrival and uncle john kissed her with the same tenderness he showed his own nieces this reception seemed to cheer maud stanton immensely she even smiled during the drive to willing square a winning gracious smile that would have caused her to be instantly recognized in almost any community of our vast country for this beautiful young girl was a famous motion picture actress possessing qualities that had endeared her to every patron of the better class photodramas at first she had been forced to adopt this occupation by the stern necessity of earning a livelihood and under the careful guidance of her aunt mrs jane montrose a widow who had at one time been a favorite in new york social circles maud and her sister florence had applied themselves so intelligently to their art that their compensation had become liberal enough to enable them to have a modest competence one cause of surprise at maud's sudden journey east was the fact that her services were in eager demand by the managers of the best producing companies on the pacific coast where nearly all the american pictures are now made Another cause for surprise was that she came alone, leaving her Aunt Jane and her sister Flo, usually her inseparable companion, in Los Angeles. But they did not question her until the cosy home at Willing Square was reached, luncheon served, and Maud installed in the guest room. Then the three girls had a good long talk, and presently came trooping into the library to enlighten Uncle John and Ajo. Oh, Uncle, what do you think? cried patsy maud is going to the war the war echoed miss Merrick in a bewildered voice what on earth can she's going to be a nurse explained beth a soft glow of enthusiasm mantling her pretty face isn't it splendid uncle hmm said uncle john regarding the girl with wonder it's certainly a a surprising venture but see here maud it's mighty dangerous protested young jones it's a tremendous undertaking and what can a girl do in the midst of all those horrors maud seated herself quietly between them her face was grave and thoughtful i have had to answer many such arguments before now as you may suspect she began in even tones but the fact that i am here well on my journey is proof that i have convinced my aunt my sister and all my western friends that i am at least determined on my mission whether it be wise or foolish i do not think i shall incur danger by caring for the wounded the red cross is highly respected everywhere these days the red cross quoth uncle john yes i shall wear the red cross she continued you know that i am a trained nurse it was part of my education before before I had not known that until now said mr. Merrick, but I am glad that you have had that training Beth began a course at the school here, but I took her away to Europe before she graduated However, I wish more girls could be trained for nursing as it is a much more useful and admirable Accomplishment than most of them now acquire Fox trots and bunny hugs for instance said Patricia with fine disdain Patsy is a splendid nurse declared Ajo with a grateful look at that chubby miss but untrained she answered laughingly it was just common sense that enabled me to cure your malady ajo i couldn't bandage a cut or bullet wound to save me fortunately said maud i have a diploma which will gain for me the endorsement of the american red cross society i am counting on that to enable me to get an appointment at the seat of war where i can be of most use where will you go asked the boy to germany austria russia belgium or i shall go to france she replied 
I speak French, but understand little of German, although once I studied the language. Are you fully resolved upon this course, Maud? asked Mr. Merrick in a tone of regret. Fully decided, sir. I am going to Washington tomorrow to get my credentials, and then I shall take the first steamer to Europe. There was no arguing with Maud Stanton when she assumed that tone. It was neither obstinate nor defiant, yet it conveyed a quiet resolve that was unanswerable. For a time they sat in silence, musing on the many phases of this curious project. Then Beth came to Mr. Merrick's side and asked pleadingly, May I go with her, Uncle? Great Scott! he exclaimed with a nervous jump. You, Beth? Yes, Uncle. I so long to be of help to those poor fellows who are being so cruelly sacrificed, and I know I can soothe much suffering if I have the opportunity. He stared at her, not knowing what to reply. This quaint little man was so erratic himself in his sudden resolves and eccentric actions that he could scarcely quarrel with his niece for imitating an example he had frequently set. Still, he was shrewd enough to comprehend the reckless daring of the proposition. Two unprotected girls in the midst of war and carnage, surrounded by foreigners, inspired to noble sacrifice through ignorance and inexperience, and hardly old enough to travel alone from Hoboken to Brooklyn. Why, the thing's absurd, he said. Quite impractical, added Ajo, nodding wisely. You're both too pretty, my dears, to undertake such an adventure. Why, the wounded men would all fall in love with their nurses and follow you back to America in a flock, and that might put a stop to the war for lack of men to fight it. Don't be silly, Ajo, said Patsy severely. I've decided to go with Maud and Beth, and you know very well that the sight of my freckled face would certainly chill any romance that might arise. That's nonsense, Patsy. Then you consider me beautiful, Uncle John? I mean, it's nonsense about you going with Maud and Beth. I won't allow it. Oh, Uncle, you know I can twine you round my little finger if I choose. So don't, for goodness sake, start a rumpus by trying to set your will against mine. Then side with me, dear. I'm quite right, I assure you. You're always right, Nunky dear, she cried, giving him a resounding smack of a kiss on his chubby cheek as she sat on the arm of his chair. But I'm going with the girls just the same and you might as well make up your mind to it. Uncle John coughed. He left his chair and trotted up and down the room a moment. Then he carefully adjusted his spectacles, took a long look at Patsy's face, and heaved a deep sigh of resignation. Thank goodness that's settled, said Patsy cheerfully. Uncle John turned to the boy, saying dismally, I've done everything in my power for these girls, and now they defy me. They've declared a thousand times they love me, and yet they trot off to bandage a lot of unknown foreigners and leave me alone to worry my heart out. Why don't you go along? asked Jones. I'm going. You? Of course. I've a suspicion our girls have the right instinct, sir, the tender, womanly instinct that makes us love them. At any rate, I'm going to stand by them. It strikes me as the noblest and grandest idea a girl ever conceived, and if anything could draw me closer to these three young ladies— who had me pretty well snared before. It is this very proposition. I don't see why, muttered Uncle John, wavering. I'll tell you why, sir. For themselves, they have all the good things of life at their command. They could bask in luxury to the end of their days if they so desired. Yet their wonderful womanly sympathy goes out to the helpless and suffering, the victims of the cruelest war the world has ever known, and they promptly propose to sacrifice their ease and brave whatever dangers may befall, that they may relieve to some extent the pain and agony of those wounded and dying fellow creatures. Foreigners, said Uncle John weakly. Human beings, said the boy. Patsy marched over to Ajo and gave him a sturdy whack on the back that nearly knocked him over. The spirit of John Paul Jones still goes marching on, she cried. My boy, you're the right stuff, and I'm glad I doctored you. He smiled, looking from one to another of the three girls questioningly. Then I'm to go along? he asked. We shall be grateful, answered Maud, after a moment's hesitation. This is all very sudden to me, for I had planned to go alone. That wouldn't do at all, asserted Uncle John briskly. 
I am astonished and and grieved that my nieces should want to go with you, but perhaps the trip will prove interesting. Tell me what steamer you want to catch, Maud, and I'll reserve rooms for our entire party. No, said Jones. Don't do it, sir. Why not? There's the Arabella. Let's use her. To cross the ocean? She has done that before. It will assist our enterprise, I'm sure, to have our own boat. These are troublous times on the high seas. Patsy clapped her hands gleefully. That's it, a hospital ship, she exclaimed. They regarded her with various expressions, startled, doubtful, admiring, approving. Presently, with added thought on the matter, the approval became unanimous. It's an amazing suggestion, said Maud, her eyes sparkling. Think how greatly it will extend our usefulness, said Beth. Uncle John was again trotting up and down the room, this time in a state of barely repressed excitement. The very thing, cried he, clever, practical, and, uh, uh, tremendously interesting. Now, then, listen carefully, all of you. It's up to you, Jones, to accompany Maud on the night express to Washington. Get the Red Cross Society to back our scheme and supply us with proper credentials. The Arabella must be rated as a hospital ship, and our party endorsed as a distinct private branch of the Red Cross, what they call a unit. I'll give you a letter to our senator, and he will look after our passports and all necessary papers. I... I helped elect him, you know, and while you're gone, it shall be my business to fit the ship with all the supplies we shall need to promote our mission of mercy. I'll share the expense, proposed the boy. No, you won't. You've done enough in furnishing the ship and crew. I'll attend to the rest. And Beth and I will be Uncle John's assistants, said Patsy. We shall want heaps of lint and bandages, drugs and liniments, and... And above all, a doctor, advised Ajo. One of the mates on my yacht, Kelsey by name, is a halfway physician, having studied medicine in his youth and practiced it on the crew for the last dozen years. But what we really need on a hospital ship is a bang-up surgeon. This promises to become an expensive undertaking, remarked Maud with a sigh. Perhaps it will be better to let me go alone, as I originally expected to do. But if we take along the hospital ship, do not be extravagant, Mr. Merrick, in equipping it. I feel that I have been the innocent cause of drawing you all into this venture, and I do not want it to prove a hardship to my friends. All right, Maud, returned Uncle John with a cheerful grin. I'll try to economize now that you've warned me. Ajo smiled, and Patsy Doyle laughed outright. They knew it would not inconvenience the little rich man, in the slightest degree, to fit out a dozen hospital ships. End of chapter 2